So I pulled back in again and lined up. This time I was ready for it. I shot, then came off, went, whoa, right back in. You know, we're pulling six Gs. And the sidewinder comes back in, and right at that last minute, it kind of turns left, goes right up the tailpipe. One potato, two potato, big boom. Two pieces of MiG-21 come out of the front and slam right into the ground. and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Vincent Aiello, call signed Yellow. And joining me today in the Circle Air Group Studios here at Gillespie Field in San Diego, California, is Mr. Kurt Dose. Dozo, as he's known, is credited with an air-to-air -air victory over a MiG-21 in Vietnam. He's part of the only father-son duo to each be credited with air-to-air -air victories. He was a Top Gun graduate, an early test pilot of the F-14 Tomcat, and so much more, as we'll uncover here, I hope, in the next hour or so. Dozo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you, and uh, I really look forward to unpacking all this, like I said, because you've had some pretty amazing experiences. It's been uh, quite a career in, uh, in a historic time, so I think, I think I got lucky. Okay, well, I hear that a lot on this show, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'll let you have one of those, but not too many. Well, let's start with, who is Robert Dose? Robert Dose was my father. Okay. Uh, this is a very distinguished dad. He was... Uh, he he won World War II. I won Vietnam. That's the way my grandkids put it. Okay. But but uh, he started off in in biplane torpedo airplanes uh, with three three people in them, <laughs> and was in San Diego in 1942, and met up with Jumpin' Joe Clifton, uh, and talked him into letting him transition to the F4U Corsair. So. That was somebody show, showed him how to start it, and then he just had to get his 35 hours before the ship departed two days later. <laughs> and uh, he went out. They, he actually went out with the with the Corsair, and then they decided that they didn't want the Corsair aboard the ship, so they dropped the Corsairs off at at uh, with the Marines on the islands, and sent them F6s, and so they they flew Hellcats. Uh, through the South Pacific, um, he later, uh, he, you know, much later, uh, flew the uh, uh, first. He, he made the first uh, mirror landing on a Navy ship uh, in VX-3, flying the FJ, and then uh, flew the F-8, which he liked tremendously. He was the first one to punch out of an F-8 oh, no. uh, following a gun ingestion problem, uh, ended up parachuting into the water off of Atlantic City in January. Oof. Um, yeah, very, very close, close call there. But this was me growing up, was, sure. was dad doing these things. Uh, he, he was the, um, they tasked him to fly from the Atlantic Ocean, I'm sorry, from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, carrier to carrier with two F-8s, flew supersonic most of the time across the United States, hit, an, hit, hit a savage over Dallas, and then climbed back up to 43,000 feet and uh, came down and met uh, uh, President Eisenhower was, was aboard ship to uh, kind of <laughs> wow. demonstrate what the Navy F F-8 could do. Wow. So it's pretty impressive. Um, I grew up on Navy bases. That's, that's, you know, what we did. We just kind of went from East Coast to West Coast, East Coast to West Coast. I had three different high schools and, and six different elementary schools, and I just kind of got used to that. Uh, always airplanes in the air and, and uh, the sound of freedom. was pretty sure I wanted to go aviation. Uh, my father uh, was not for this, actually. He thought that the time for for being exposed to flak sites and, and missile batteries 
is don't do it in an airplane, do it where you can hide someplace. So he, he thought I should go submarines. And I actually have a nuclear science degree from the Naval Academy. Wow. But I changed uh, when, I, when we went and flew the airplanes down in Pensacola. I just loved, uh, loved the feeling. I had yeah. done some flying, but I hadn't flown jets before. And, and they put us in T2 Buckeyes and uh, just was magical when it lifted into the air. I'll bet. It yeah. was in your blood, in, in your DNA yeah. from such a I young guess. age. But um, hold on. I want to comment on a couple of things, if you don't mind. I just find it so funny that today to fly a new airplane and get what we would call a NATOPS check. I don't know if you called it that then, but it's like a six month process. You, know, you get, get the orders, go to the simulators, get the lectures, do some self study on the computer, and then, and then maybe go fly a few times. But oh, here's a Corsair, and oh, by the way, you're getting on a boat in 30 hours. I mean, I can't even imagine when he did his CQ. But um, and then oh, here's a new airplane in the middle of deployment. Uh, and you said something about a mirror landing. Can you explain that? I think I know what you're talking about, but just to be sure. Yeah. Uh, he was the first one to make a landing using the British uh, Fresnel lens kind of kind of landing. I, th I think it was still a Fresnel lens, but uh, the, the uh, glide slope bounced off the mirror, and it gave you a three-and-a-half-degree glide slope all the way to touchdown. And before that, they were just doing it with paddles uh, out there with his, That's right. uh, you know, up and down yeah. and, and left and, and right. And, all. and a yeah. big cut. Yeah. yeah. That's why LSOs to this day are called paddles. Um, yeah. Was there one of those systems where it was, no kidding, a reflection of your actual aircraft? Like there was a reference and then you saw yourself above or below? I thought I remember. No, I don't, think, I don't think so. I, uh, I think you just yeah. saw, again, a, instead of the, we have the, the lens that goes up and down and and change you know changes colors right. ho hopefully not oh i've seen some red <laughs> <laughs> um, but but this was just a a big uh, microphone a, a big mirror yeah yeah and it had a a, a lens that okay. shot three and a half degrees up the glide slope so i've been trying to corral some LSOs into this studio so we can talk about not only the history of paddles and landing on ships, but also the future with this magic carpet. I don't know how much you keep in touch, but apparently yeah. it takes a lot of the thrill and danger out of it, which could be good. But at any rate, that's for another day. Tell me though, how on earth, I mean, we can't spend too much time on this, but I would think the Naval Academy would want some bang for the buck. If you had a nuke degree, I'm surprised they let you out of it. Well, I did get to talk to Rick over. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But, Admiral Rick over. Yeah. But, Father of the modern nuclear Navy or whatever yeah. we call it. Yeah. But I was pretty set, and, and I had good enough grades to select the service that I wanted. So oh, wow. I, I wanted to go fighters and got myself a, a date in, in Pensacola mm -hmm. two weeks after we graduated. Oh, so fantastic. It was... I have time, some, time to get going. I have some young people that uh, are fans of the show and are waiting, I think, something like 18 months now from commissioning to starting because I don't know if it's Top Gun Maverick or just the way the world is, but it's taking them some time. Now, but before we focus the rest of this time on you, I did mention that you're part of a duo, the father-son uh, aerial victories. Tell us about your fathers, uh, how many, what were circumstances, and... Uh, Dad got one or two, depending ah. on on where you read, okay. and so uh, I'm still catching up. <laughs> um, he did shoot down a zero. Uh, he was very proud that uh, his air wing never lost an airplane to oh, wow. uh, zero fight uh, to enemy fighters. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't ever talk that much about this. This is I, I, one of my regrets in life is is not peeling back the onion, you know, get him cornered and, and have him talk more. I've learned uh, quite a lot by looking at his logbooks. It's very interesting the difference between the way they fought World War II and the way we fought Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, they would go in and, and do two or three days of high intensity flying and then as soon as the CBs got the runway cleared they'd be landing on on the you know sh uh, islands and and sleeping a sleeping ashore um, compared to our Vietnam experience where you you would do three solid weeks of pounding into North Vietnam and 
stop for funerals and sure. take two days off and then uh, right back at it again. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, this was, it was what we were used to. It's what he's used to. Um, he, he, was, uh, he, he was a good, good officer. Okay. He later was uh, skipper of the Midway. Oh. Uh, so wow. I, I see his plaque when I, when I tour the Midway, I say hi, Dad. Unfortunately, he died uh, 15 years ago. So. 15, well, rest his soul. Sounds like he left quite a legacy and uh, you wanted to follow in his footsteps. So you said you flew the T2. Now I flew the T2C with the two engines. Is that what was already around by then or? I flew them all. You flew them all, A, B, <laughs> yeah. and C? Yeah, we had A, because B's and C's. Because some had single C's. engine, right? Yes, a, the, B, a, I the A had uh, the a, single okay. engine. The B had two engines. Okay. Yeah. Was the A underpowered, dare I ask? Because the C not, didn't. Not no? in my regard. <laughs> when you press the <laughs> throttle forward, yeah. it went fast right. and, and uh, it was a good airplane. Good. All right. Well, so you, so we skipped over a little bit of detail. You, I think, enrolled in the uh, Navy Reserve in high school and were accepted into the academy. We know how that went. Accepted to flight school. That's great. But when you finished flight school, you didn't do what a lot of people do and go straight to the fleet. You did what some people do and stuck around. They had a program called SIRGRAD that uh, I, I went, I, so I, I flew the T-34, the T-2, uh, and then, uh, oh, the Cougar, oh, yeah, right. and then we flew the uh, the Cougar aboard the, aboard the boat. And then, uh, so I finished, I, I did my whole uh, flight training in 13 months wow. uh, coming out of the Naval Academy. And um, when I got ready to, uh, to get assignments, and I was, you know, number one, doing great, and uh, they said, you've done so well that we're going to plow you back in VT-21 for... A year, okay, and then uh, when you get done with your year, then you can have any airplane you want. Um, I didn't want to do that. I figured I'd be the only JG in the in the Navy without Vietnam experience. Uh, as it turns out, uh, this was pretty valuable training. There's nothing like teaching something to to learn how to do it. So. We started off in the in the Cougar, a the a single seater and the and the dual seat Cougars, and then uh, when they brought the TA four J online, VT twenty one was the first airplane to get it. Okay. So, uh, again, quick quick checkout. Yeah. We 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 would do checkouts in three days, kind yes. of thing, and and then you're and then you're flying both airplanes, um, and these were these were good training and had a gun and and uh this was it, it was uh excellent so what year was it you finished flight school and were 69 i finished okay. flight school and so the war was raging yes and you wanted to not that you're i'm guessing if i may speak for you a warmonger but hey there's something going on i'd like to test my metal and go do my part i don't want to be the one guy at the party who has to say oh yeah i was home training so you had some desire to do that uh, but they kept you as, a, you said, Sir Grad. I think that's selectively retained graduate because you had done well and you wanted to teach, well, they wanted you to teach other students coming along. So you do that for a year, and then what happens? And then I went to Miramar, uh, and uh, I was selected for F-4s and was assigned as a replacement pilot for BF-92, which was online uh, on the America. Okay. So, uh, again... A very pretty quick checkout uh, in the F-4. I think it was like six weeks. Uh, and then uh, I was told to report to America, and so I, I flew out there uh, with my best man, Bill Townsend. Uh, so we flew out on Continental and landed at Clark and then um, made our way went down to QB Point and nothing was happening there so we had to go to uh, Da Nang and um, get a ride out to the ship from from Da Nang and uh, we <laughs> I got the you know we're on the sh on there this uh, uh, whatever the Air Force was flying something with with two props on it and, and uh, it flew us back to Da Nang mm -hmm. and they had uh, customs forms and the customs forms said you know did you bring 
three thousand dollars of money or you know what do you have any drugs and I actually had my flight gear with me so I did have drugs I had I had like part of the first aid kit and, or something and yeah yeah okay. I had this full survival kit and you and answered a, honestly I, I did. I, nobody told me differently. <laughs> so, so I did. Yes, I got those. I've got some of that. Yeah, I got that. I've got a pistol. Yeah, I, I, we're all set. Well, they they met me at the airplane and hauled me off to to uh, spend the night in jail uh, as they're getting this down. And and um, and the next morning he comes in with a, a letter and and it's from the CEO of VF uh, ninety two that says. Well, thank God you got that guy. We've been trying to nail him for years. Would you please box up all of that evidence and put it in a in a bag, and we're sending a C1 in, and we'll pick him up. That's right. We and want to deal with him we, here. We'll deal with him. We, we're <laughs> going to get him good. So uh, I went to the ship with that knowledge, knowing that uh, this is the way I'm going to meet the skipper. Um, and we, we landed uh, there in, in flight ops off of North Vietnam, uh, on America, landed. Somebody came and uh, picked up my bags and and took me to the ready room. The skipper was laying in the back of the ready room, and I, I'm all ready. To, I've got two or three uh, different approaches that I'm <laughs> liable to take Choose on this. That. And he and and I started say, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. And and he said, Now, never mind that. How are you feeling? I said, Well, I feel great. And he said, Well, I'd like you to fly my wing. We're going to do a vigilante escort into North Vietnam in three hours. If, if like today. Like today, yes. Oh, so they introduced me to my Rio, and we went to the Paraloft and got another funny little pistol that, that we shot the flares out of and uh, got everything signed out. And we got the briefing from the skipper. We got the briefing from the RA-5C and then uh, went to the flight deck. And... He, uh, and this is what we trained for. Wow. This this is what 121 was was training us to be. Mm -hmm. Walking across, ducking under airplanes, stepping over bombs, and and uh, finally find your mm -hmm. your airplane. It looked like F4s that I'd been flying for six weeks. So uh, <laughs> this must be the oh, way goodness. we do it. So oh, uh, introduced me to the plane captain, and we pre-flighted and climbed in and. Pretty soon, two of them are turning, and uh, and off we go. <laughs> I just—it's amazing to me because the Navy and maybe society larger is just so risk averse these days. You know, everything is oh, you got to acclimate to the new time zone, and eh, to a point, right? I get it, but this was war, and you're a needed young pilot, and you're fresh. Like you said, you've been trained. It's not like you didn't know what you were doing, and you brought your helmet with you. Is that the very <laughs> helmet over your right that shoulder is there? My that, helmet, uh, yes. You wore VF ninety-two. Yes. Is that? I'm gonna probably embarrassed myself. Is that the squadron that was the Blue Angels became that or something? Or was that a different one? I thought the I Blue Angels so. had to disband during Korea. Anyway, I, I should know better by now, a couple of years into podcasting, to open my mouth if I'm not sure. But um, I thought it was something in the 90s at any rate. All right. So that was mission number one. Uh, and you're welcome to talk about that if you'd like. But what now, when is this? What year are we in month maybe even? This is uh, July or, or August, I guess, of uh, 69. Oh, 69? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wow. All right. So this is deployment number one, mission number one. And uh, what happens? Are you, is it, you're comfortable or is it kind of scary? <laughs> I should have been a lot more scared. Oh. <laughs> uh, I launched off, uh, everything was fine, climbed up, found the tanker, uh, joined on the tanker's wing, uh, skipper pulled off and I, went in and got 4,000 pounds. Uh, and then the Vigi took us in through South Vietnam, up th through Laos, and then we entered uh, Magia Pass and dropped it down to about 10,000 feet. Uh, flight, the, the weather was pretty nice. It was, it was clear, but, but as, as we started getting close to the target, I'm, I'm trying to write down notes on my kneeboard card so I can, you know, that I saw a truck here and, and that looked like a missile site and whatever. And every time I'd look up at the vigilante, it, he got harder and harder to see as we, as we approached the target. 
uh, there were clouds developing around between myself, I was on the right wing, and Skipper was on the left, uh, and f fighter wing, we, you, were, you know, half mile back kind of thing. And uh, um, it was to the point where I couldn't even see the, the RA-5. I just was flying down the runway now, and the skipper calls up and says, uh, kite two, brake left. And so I went left, and I felt bad because I thought that maybe I was out of position and that, that this was, you don't want the skipper coming up and telling you how to fly formation. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and, and then we, we joined up, and as we're, we're coming back out, the RA-5C says, uh, kite two, uh, you, you've got the lead. Let me check you over. And I went, okay. <laughs> so the big vigilante's going, poking around underneath and, and looking. He says, oh, you look all right. I said, okay, kite one, you've got the lead. I'll check you over <laughs> just because that's obviously what you do in combat. Mm -hmm. So went and checked him. He was fine. And we came in and broke and landed. I've got my kneeboard card. I'm all ready. And we head to IOIC, and the uh, vigilante is doing the debrief, and he's talking about coming into the target area that uh, we get heavy flack and that uh, Kite 2 had two SAMs shot at him, but he managed to avoid both of them nicely. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking over at, at, at Jack Wood, my, my Rio, and I said, they shoot Sam's at us. <laughs> he said, yeah, and all the warnings, all you know, all the singer high, singer low, all of that stuff was just pure textbook. And by the way, your brake turn was beautiful, and you just shook that guy right off of us. And uh, I went, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was, this was the first mission, and wow. so I should have been dead. Uh, 300 missions later, I was a, a little more... Uh, under control and and we did see these things but uh yeah it's i don't know how you simulate that we have the uh cubic system the the i can't remember what the name of it is but the the missiles on the airplane and you go to yuma and there's a there's like an electronic range or yeah something like an electronic that. Yeah. range that's that's starts putting you into a war environment mm -hmm. when they're not really shooting at you, but you can feel like they are. Right. Uh, and um, that was that was important. You wow. can see why you lose you lose right. people on their first 10 flights. Well, so. they try to now simulate those first 10 flights, like you said, yes. in different ranges yeah. or exercises uh, for the Navy ACMR. up in Fallon, Red yeah. Flag, and, and so on. Now, the Rio was talking about all the lights were the lights on in your cockpit too, but you were just maybe test saturated? Okay. Yeah, I think so it I took just, time yeah, to build yeah. some situational awareness. Well, later um, on, you, you had, you know, one train of thought was following all the lights in the, in the cockpit and, you know, mm -hmm. and the things that they were telling you, and another one for ICS talking to the Rio, and another one for the radio, you're talking to the mission commander, uh, you know, weapons, and... And then another one for guard to hear the ejections when when they're going off. So um, you just would channel that stuff and and fly the airplane. And, yeah. and uh, that's the amazing thing about flying fighters, flying navy navy airplanes is that the things you can do with them is just so true. unbelievable. And Upside down, backwards doesn't matter. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're just doing what you need to do. And the people you do it with, I know yeah. you will agree. Goodness All right, see. so this is 1969. Now about this time, we have been, dare I say, licking our wounds a little bit from our performance in Vietnam. So uh, a captain named Alt uh, does a report and that report goes to the Pentagon. The Pentagon says, hey, I think it was 121, right? You need to stand up some specialized training. And so those folks uh, go and do their thing and what we now know as Top Gun, and so when you get home from that deployment, you're selected to go, what, 1970? Yes. I and mean, this thing has barely gotten going. You're one of the newest students. What was it like to go, and, and at the time, did you think it was anything more than, because right, we go on all kinds of different training. You go to learn how to put out fires on the ship, which you know everyone needs to do if the ship's on fire. You go to survival school, you go to evasion and different things. So did you think much of this particular opportunity? 
Absolutely, and I was thrilled to be appointed okay. to to be the the squadron pilot that would go to Top Gun. Good. And um, when I w- first went through VF one twenty one, you you knew there was something going on over in the trailers uh-huh. on on the side, but uh, okay. it wasn't it wasn't something that everybody got to fly with. Uh, but um, it was still kind of the same way when when I went through. They they just had some office spaces that they that they were uh, give you briefing on yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and um, marvelous marvelous instruction uh, with our airplanes you, you use your own airplanes mm-hmm. and uh, they had uh, a4s and f5s uh, t38s to act as the to adversary acting for as the adversary against. and we would yeah. we would train against them and right start off with 2v2 and then 2v4 and uh, yeah. going on. And then you're also doing different uh, radar and uh, bombing missions. You, so we've fired the gun, we've fired missiles, and um, marvelous pilots uh, that I still enjoy running into at Tailhook and whatever today. Mm-hmm. Um, these are the... Uh, the legends of the F4, yeah. mostly F4 community. We use the F8s more for adversary than uh, than actual. Uh, I don't, I'm not. I, I don't know whether they were were doing F8s in Top Gun. I think they just were I think doing. They F4s. were incorporated a little bit later, but they had their own like gunnery school and okay. uh, type of weapon school type thing, as I recall. So. Wow. Of course, this, and this was part of Miramar. Mm-hmm. You had the F-4s on one side of the base and the F-8s on the other side, uh, and it was a hoot. <laughs> the, the, there was, you talk about a wartime footing, mm-hmm. there was a free-for-all uh, Friday afternoon off, off Whiskey 291. and uh, That's the warning area yeah, off the coast. and you would just dive into that, and it was Katie bar the door, uh, anything. So whoever showed up just dogfight with what you see. Yes, huh? exactly. Oh and goodness. and you see crazy things. And even the Air Force would <laughs> heard about it and start <laughs> Fly sending, over from get some F 100s and or I'm sorry, uh, a Delta Dart, whatever uh, that is. One oh two or six. Two, I, I think. Yeah. Those two. yeah. Delta Dagger and Delta Dart. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and so they'd come in. So they'd <laughs> swing over and show up and just <laughs> yeah, I know. get in the fray. My goodness. And That's then, probably good training. I mean it's a little reckless by again today's standards, but um, it's good to just, oh, there's something, and, and you can pick up the different angles and see what you see. So Top Gun, did you feel you learned a lot at that? I mean, because, oh, again. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. it was tremendous and, and uh, great instructors and good good things to carry back to the squadron. And mm-hmm. and then we would do a little workup with the Top Gun instructors <coughs> and uh, just three or four flights kind of thing that, mm-hmm. that they would mix show us some of the things that they're working on but then it was mostly just me as a weapons training officer to try and uh, convey these thoughts that that we were doing that you you don't uh, hard turn with a MiG-17 and and that uh, gun sights take four seconds to settle and MiG-17 has a slow rate of roll things that were important to us to uh know when when we got involved with a, a MIG, MIG activity. Yeah. And this was, Top Gun was relatively new, so I think they called it the power projection. So you were really the, the classic candidate for this. You'd been out on a deployment and flown, you said 300 total, so I'm guessing, what, maybe 100 or, or so on that first deployment. Yeah, yeah. Came home with some experience, but now you can get the PhD level, in a sense, right there at home. And then you go back out and deploy, what, in 71, 72? 71, 72 yeah. in yeah. a constellation. Okay. Same with VF-92 again? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you are now the tactics officer, Top Gun graduate in your squadron. And when you show back up off of, uh, I guess, what was it, Yankee Station, I think they called it, right? Um, is this when, I think, Operation Linebacker 2 is yes. starting to kick off? So yes. A little bit of uh, force to the punch now. and. So what happens on this second deployment? I'm building up to May 10th of 1972 in this book we have on the table here. Yeah, we shouldn't even have been there. Um, yeah, so May 10th, uh, I'm sorry, um, 
on the second deployment on Constellation, we deployed out of San Diego mm -hmm. and went right to Yankees or right to Dixie Station to, to okay. kind of warm up as as you you know try some uh, South Vietnamese tactics uh, and uh, the linebacker two didn't didn't happen for about f five months uh, that we were that we were there okay. uh, and things got real serious. We started mining harbors and and uh, the B-52s started going into North Vietnam. We would uh, actually escort the B-52s in and take on the SAM sites uh, with rock eyes and, and try and take them out. Um, and things and the, the MiG activity picked up. Um, so we had been uh, most of the most of the crews, the A7s had trouble dropping bombs. There, something was wrong with with them. So we were doing the bomb dropping also. So carrying six Mark 82s in, uh, and um, doing bomb drop bo bomb dropping stuff. <laughs> I mean, it 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 wasn't that tough. I think every one I dropped hit the ground. So that that was uh, <laughs> hopefully we hear the enemy. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, um, and uh, this was it was difficult times. This was this was pretty heavy stuff. You you going into places in North Vietnam that that uh, you probably lost an airplane or two the day before, and so you know that that they're real serious and um, extra attention down in, in IYC uh, trying to plan your missions and yeah. find a, a successful way to get in there. You said that earlier. Is that like the intelligence center on the ship? I think they call it Civic now. Uh, I don't remember I'll what it's called. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. We can po post it on the video and show everyone. But, yeah. so, but it's the place you go to get your intelligence before and then debrief after, hey, I saw this or this shot at me or this indication. Exactly. And so during this time, I have to think, and I'm not – trying to necessarily celebrate this, but you talked about some of the challenges and the pain of doing this. I have to think you either saw or definitely knew of folks that were shot down. In some cases, maybe you didn't see a shoot or you did and figured they were going to be joining a long list of other people with poor treatment at the hands of the enemy. But uh, that had to weigh on you a little bit. Was that kind of a scary uh, every mission? And it could be you. No, it, you, you definitely, you were aware of that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I came as a replacement pilot. I, I, that, that's how I because got to the squadron because somebody had been shot down. Wow. Yeah. So, um, it, it did it did wear on you. Uh, I, I always uh, the F fours. I'm sure you were doing the same thing when when we when we'd land. They'd they'd put us up on the bow on the on the port side, mm -hmm. and they'd be <coughs> safing the missiles and and getting everything ready and and then so you you park and then i i knew i couldn't climb down the side of the f4 <laughs> without falling onto the steel flight deck because so I, I i would take some extra time i'd be sorting my charts and putting things away and i i felt a little bit bad about that until i would look up the whole port side of the of the bow and all the Rio canopies are open, and all the pilot canopies are still closed. They're gathering and, themselves. And everybody's gathering up and yeah. trying to get all of this back in your head. Yeah. Uh, because, but your legs were wobbly, right? Yeah, that's I, what I mean. The, yeah. the legs are doing this, mm -hmm. and, and it's just scared the I, crap out of you. It, right. it, uh, we would dive into places. They'd... <laughs> We use the Falcon codes to talk to these facts that say, okay, take out that gun that's uh, down there at the, at the base of the hill, and this thing's lobbing 23s and 37s up at you kind of thing, and you dive on that kind of stuff, and this stuff's just going right by your head. It just doesn't seem it doesn't seem possible that it misses you. Right. Uh, they're shooting at you. That's the whole that's right. the whole point. Yeah, and so. That and the and the Sams, uh, we'd get four Sams shot at us every every uh, attack. I mean that 
each kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So you've got the bar cap and the mid cap and the tar cap and and everybody's doing their own surviving against SA2s, which come up on a booster and then get in, into uh, the second stage is mm-hmm. doing about Mach 3 and, and coming at you and you, you watch them. You, you watch them coming up and you want to find out whether they're on you or not, so you give the airplane a little negative G and if they if the missile turns then then it's on you if it doesn't turn then you're looking to see who who's going to get this so thing because it's maybe. it's coming up mm-hmm. and you you try yeah but then you you go into a brake maneuver that shakes down but it knocks you down 5000 feet because you yeah, trying to keep your speed, speed. Mm-hmm. and then here comes another one and so now you're knocked now you're now you're at 7000 feet and now suddenly you're at 2000 feet and all the AAA is coming up, so that's why your knees shake when you <laughs> when you get back. And and um, wow. it's it's a, it's an amazing. The naval aircraft carrier is just a remarkable vehicle for exerting force against somebody that uh, you want to influence. Mm-hmm. Um, we there there's just lots there's lots to uh, it has a lot of capacity lot, lot, lot to capacity yes i i never had anything remotely close to that dozo i the only time my legs ever gave me some struggle was after a particularly difficult night of landing and the ship was pitching it was dark and everything else and uh but that pales in comparison i was just me doing it to myself well and the sea but not getting shot at so God bless you and all the people who <laughs> dealt with that. And day in, day out, right? Again, it's like, okay, it's not a one-time thing. Uh, you're going to go out and do it again. Maybe, did you ever fly more than one mission in a day, or was that pretty common? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. quite often. Really? Okay, wow. All right. And then you'd be doing Alert 5 during your time off, so in the middle of the night you're sleeping up in the cockpit with a in pillow. In case they and, decide to come out, which is yeah. pretty rare, right? I don't, did those ever get launched? No, they did. Probably, oh, well. you know, once a month kind of thing. Okay. or For a threat or to go respond to something? Just to respond to something, to take, take a look at uh, okay. something coming out. All right. Crazy. Well, let's lead up to, if you're willing, May 10th of 1972. And that date sticks out in my mind. I think there was a lot of activity that day it was the bloodiest day of the war this was the most mig kills uh most uh losses during during any any day and so we started off uh as the first alpha strike uh from constellation there were five carriers online um and i was uh so I was uh, a mid cap, two two F fours, Austin Hawkins, Jay Tinker, uh, Jim McDivitt in my back seat, and and me, and we launched uh, I think forty airplanes on this first Alpha Strike. Wow! A, From again. one carrier. Yes. Wow. For uh, and then so Alpha Strike operations. If you're, uh, this is the difference between cyclic operations where we'd run generally run about seven missions, mm-hmm. and then. When you're when you're just doing normal strike into into Vietnam kind of thing, you the first first flight would launch, the second flight would man up, then they'd launch, then the first flight would land, and right. and you'd just cycle through, and you do about seven cycles. Uh, during Alpha strikes, you launch everything uh, three times a day, kind of thing. So it all so goes. It all everything comes goes. Back, gets anything turned. that's ready to fly well, goes up again, right. well, and so. Um, we had been working on, on Haiphong and Hanoi. Uh, we were pretty familiar with it. We'd been there before. Um, and so we launched off, uh, got 3,000 3, pounds off the tankers and then all got into formation and headed towards, uh, North Vietnam. Came in the coast, uh, um, Hawkins was the flight lead. He took us north of Haiphong and kind of set us up right over a top of a 100-millimeter battery that was pounding these big black furball <laughs> things at us. And so we, we moved a little bit farther east 
uh, or farther west rather, and uh, got clear. And we're watching the, the strikes come in, and they're, they've got good secondaries going off of this petroleum storage area. And they're calling uh, feet wet, feet wet as they come off the target. And uh, as so as the last airplane's coming off the target, we're going to just go ahead and clear the area Close one more time. And, kind of and uh, Red Crown comes up. Uh, and, and says bandits, bandits, uh, blue bandits, zero four zero at twenty five. Well, that meant that was from Bullseye zero four zero twenty five uh, was Kep Airfield, bearing in distance and from so a we, known point. We mm-hmm. knew that, and we knew that they were uh, MiG twenty ones airborne. So Austin keys the mic and says, "Kite two uh, or." Kite 300, we've got the, you know, we've, we've got that mission. Dibs. And Im- <laughs> immediately punches one negative G, and we s- start down uh, because we really didn't want anybody to call us and tell us to come back. So this is a little bit of pre-planning on, on this, but okay. this is what we had been looking for. And we were the right people. We were the MIG cap. We were the ones that would protect against uh, sure. the, you the, the mindset, this threat. Sure, you had the mindset, the loadout, and it sounds like the position. We've got four sparrows, four sidewinders. Go. Uh, each. Each, yeah, yes. That's a lot. Okay. So uh, we descend down to about uh, 10,000 feet. Uh, we're coming into the downwind on on uh, Kep Airfield, single runway with a bunch of uh, revetted uh, MiG-17s along the runway. And I'm I'm looking down, and I can see two MiG 21s holding short of the runway, going the other way, and uh, I'm trying to run through my strategy on how maybe I can swing around and hit one of these MiG 21s, you know, right where they sit, which would have been a <laughs> terrible violation of of the rules of engagement. Not very but it was either. was something that, that what I was thinking about and about that time my Rio Jim shouts out make 21s on the roll and I look back on the runway and the runway was blacktop and then concrete blacktop concrete and these things were sitting on the blacktop now and they were just obvious as heck that uh, okay. here here's two make 21s doing a section takeoff so um, I was in the best position I called uh, kite 2's got the lead burner now in place port descending and so we just did a a in place turn dove into about a 40 degree uh, descent we were already doing about 500 knots it was too too late to punch the tanks off because they had a a lower setting that so we just went down and the intent was to roll out and come down the runway right after the MiG 21s and and uh, maybe get them right when their gear's coming up if we could. It didn't, didn't quite work out that well, but uh, it might have. During the descent in this humid air, the F-4 filled the cockpit full of smoke. So I'm, I'm sitting here. I've leveled off at about 50 feet. We're doing 1.2. Uh, I've got sidewinders growling in my ear, and I know there's a control tower up here, and I've got to miss that thing so oh I, I reached down and dumped the cabin pressurization yeah. and that clears the air out so yeah, everything not was, smoke but uh, condensation, it was condensation like a yeah, inside, yeah. yeah so <clears throat> and here you know we're looking at two make 21s and I, so i tell uh hawk that uh, i'll take the one on the right you've got the one on the left about that time they go into a break they drop their tanks hit the grass and the fire is going on up there because they're and full of fuel they just took off <laughs> and we're we're going through trees down, you know, again at 50 or 25 feet. I'm lifting my leg, my wing to to go over these trees, and we're going into a lag pursuit position because they're turning tighter than we are, and we want to get to a deep six six o'clock. So that worked out well, and I'm about a half a mile behind them, and I start pulling in, and. I, I uh, line up on the on the MIG, got a solid tone, squeeze the trigger. About uh, 20 minutes later, the the MIG missile finally comes off the wing. That's Time action. Yeah, this is yeah. 
It actually takes about half a second, but uh, it, it seems like that. So the Sidewinder comes off and immediately takes this gigantic turn to the left. And I'm looking at that, the mids, missile's right there. That's the MiG. Um, it's going over here. And I said, well, that one's kind of stupid. And I actually stepped to the next Sidewinder and I was going to shoot another one. And about that time, the MiG, the uh, Sidewinder, mm -hmm. comes roaring back <laughs> into the fight. And it's gone to a, it, it's shooting for a lead pursuit position where it knows where it's going to get to the, the MiG and the Sidewinder will be at the same place. So it, it did that, went right behind the Sidewinder, the MiG. blew up and yep. put a bunch of dust on the hill that, that we were <laughs> going through. So I pulled back in again and lined up. This time I was ready for it. I shot, then came off, went, whoa, right back in. You know, they we're pulling six Gs, and the Sidewinder comes back in, and right at that last minute, it kind of turns left, goes right up the tailpipe. One potato, two potato, big boom. Two pieces of MiG-21 come out of the front and slam right into the ground. Yeah. So then, I now I'm looking at the other one. <laughs> Hawk has shot a couple missiles at it, and it's not working. Uh, these were... Uh, A9Ds, uh, and they just didn't have the uh, combat fusing for for managing this this last turn, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but it's the best thing we had. I had, I talked to Jim was trying to lock him up, shoot a sparrow at him, and and in, at low altitude in a chase situation, we just right. didn't have that situation. So I pull back in and uh, I shot. A sidewinder at the at the uh, lead lead uh, MIG, and it did the same thing. Went right off after it. So then I I went ahead and I, I mean I'd had my better luck on the second sidewinder on the first one, so I figured that this is this is good to be. It happens to be Hawk's MIG, but what the heck? A thing's sitting here right in front of me, and so I uh, thought that I shot a final sidewinder. Turns out when I got back to the carrier that I still had a Sidewinder on board. The, the guidance control had fired, but the missile the oh. the, uh, the missile didn't didn't work. So mm -hmm. that's a, a different story. <laughs> um, so by this time I'm out of Sidewinders and I'm rendezvousing on this oh, uh, on this MIG, and so I decided that I would shoot a Sparrow at it. Uh, just to try and get it to turn around. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably 300 feet away from the guy at this point. Uh, I can see his little burner cans and, and uh, wow. watch his little flaps moving and, and all of this. So I pulled up into uh, the vertical so I could do a, barrel, a, a bail, aileron roll uh, attack coming around on the other side. And when I got here, I'm doing my normal look around and spot two MiG 21s that are coming in from our five o'clock. Oh. So I called Hawk and I said, "We got two more MiG 21s, five o'clock." Uh, and maybe those two you saw at the hold short. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> no, actually, I, I met those guys oh, uh, later. Well, yeah, we'll get to that. So, so we broke port and went went past these guys went whistling by these are all by the way bright silver mig 21s and they all have red soviet markings really not vietnamese markings interesting i, I remember having that conversation with myself earlier when i thought this thing's got soviet markings but he's in our airspace so there you go. so i guess we're okay yeah um so we we broke left. We accelerated back up to supersonic. We're doing 1.1, 1.15, 1 and uh, we're feeling pretty good because we know that this that the uh, MiG 21s can't be can't do supersonic below 10,000 feet. Um, and you, you think so? We're we're yeah. we're just doing combat spread. You right. know, half mile apart, and uh, Jim McDivitt again, the good Rio <laughs> says. MiG-21 coming up behind Kite-1. 
and look over, and there's just a MiG-21 sailing. I've had to be doing 1.3, 1.4, wow. uh, and this was the brand new. They had not seen this MiG, and I think that's these MiGs are being delivered to Vietnam, uh-huh. and so um, it, it turns out when, when we talked uh, the intelligence officers after this flight, kept asking me if I knew and if I knew and if I knew and I never did know and I but I finally uh, found out that the, uh, the the three and four MiGs when they came through were speaking Russian to each other so this was uh, these airplanes that they fly around off the beach uh, listening in on these conversations at any rate so he fires a missile we I've called for a break turn and we Cross, cross over each other and this missile comes sailing by me and, and goes off right under Kite uh, 1, mm-hmm. shakes him up a little bit, knocks out his radios. I, meanwhile, have come back in and I'm on this MiG again. <laughs> and Jim McDivitt, God bless these Rios, <laughs> says, uh, Kurt, what's your plan? We don't have any <laughs> sidewinders left, and, and, no uh, I'm, and I'm not getting any. Oh, with a gun, I would have killed him. I mean, it would have been so easy. Um, so I said, you're right. So I pulled back around, and, and uh, as we came around, we're looking for Kite 2, and we don't see him. Kite 1? Looking for Kite 1. Yeah, yeah. And um, and that's that's a very uncomfortable situation. Yes. We, you know, it doesn't do us any good to go back. So we're heading for the coast, and we're still at about a hundred feet. And then uh, as we there's some karst ridges uh, right next to the coast, and as we pulled up, he was on the other side of the ridge, and and we were still in formation <laughs> as we uh, launched out of there. Oh my! And the the, the uh, a3 came out and refueled us uh, at, on our on our way. Uh, I think we could have made the boat, but uh, th- that was comforting. Yes. And uh, and we landed in one of these Hollywood moments, you know, with with all the the victory on the flight deck. It was it was very good. Um, and I, as I say, when I get out of the airplane, I'm looking back at that sidewinder that's still sitting on on station two, and going, "What the, what's he doing there?" Um, and we they, they got us down to IOYC and they said w- was this a Waterloo yellow was this you know did you what what happened uh, and we said I don't know just a couple MiG-20 you know four four MiG-21s two other ones holding short uh, seemed like a good fight to us and and it turned out that they they had moved a lot of the MiG MiG twenty ones and MiG seventeens forward, uh, and this turned out to be a, just an amazing day for for naval a lot of Marine Corps victories, Air Force yeah. and yeah. and uh, wow, it turned out to be uh, very nice. Wow, that must have been an amazing feeling, right? You're trained to do this, and again, nobody wants to necessarily take a life, but this is what we do as warriors. And to do it in an aircraft is rare, but to do it as the son of someone who did it in World War II is rare. In fact, you're the only duo, as we talked about. What was that like? Did I mean, communications were difficult between ship and shore back then, but um, did you were you able to make a call or send a letter, or did your dad, how did your dad find out, and what was that like? Dad found out, you know, it was 7.30 in Vietnam when, the, when this fight happened, so... In the morning? In the morning. Okay. So it was the middle of night uh, in California. And uh, so some, uh, I don't know whether it was a telegram or or a, a message. At any rate, some, some sort s- of traffic. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? It was, I'm sorry, it was a phone call. Yeah. So somebody phoned dad. And can you imagine if, if you've got. Oh, a son in combat. Yeah, a son in, in combat, and mm-hmm. you get a call in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. This is not probably what you want. I'll, yeah. But it turned out to be your son just got a MiG-21, and and uh, so that was that made that Proud all right. Dad moment. <laughs> that yeah. I wonder if he slept anymore after that. Yeah. Wow. 
Okay. But that's not the end of deployment necessarily. I mean, the war goes on till the POWs come home in February of 73. How much more did you spend on station? We spent another two months, two months. On, online, yeah. And more kinetic activity, dropping bombs? and. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah to total. All the whole time. And, and at, at linebacker, too, I mean, this was serious stuff. We mm-hmm. were beating them down. Of course, we had done that earlier. We would... We'd beat them down, use up all their SAMs, and then Kissinger would want to go talk to them in Paris. And, Which and, is when they resupply. And then they same. resupply, and they, <laughs> now we've got all full yeah. missiles. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, uh, the way the Vietnam conflict was executed is well documented. We don't necessarily need to make this a referendum on it, but certainly from our point of view as naval aviators, not optimal. Uh, let's summarize it that way. Um, we were win- We were winning when I left. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when you come home from that deployment, is that the end of your tour then with VF-92? That was, yeah. Okay. I think I had another month or something that I stayed in the squadron, and then I went to test pilot school. So. And was that something you had decided because of the challenge of it, or how did that – Obviously, I mean, they don't – just, I'm guessing, recruit you necessarily unless you say you're interested, I would think. Yeah, well, I had I had good grades, and, mm-hmm. and uh, that seemed like where I wanted to go. Yeah, okay. the, the alternative would be to go back as a RAG instructor, which would have been great too. But sure. uh, as it turned out, it was just an excellent time to be at Pax River. I'll bet. We had, we had the last uh, nine-month syllabus uh, at Test Pilot School, Class 64, um, and they assigned me after, so test pilot school was everything you've ever imagined. Uh, they've, they've got a whole lineup of airplanes and you just go and fly them. You, you, you don't, there's no NATOPs, there's no anything. You, sometimes you'll take a, a one page answer and question sure. and answer and tell me the limits on this thing. But, um, we were f- flying a fours, uh, a little, a little bit of every T thirty eights, you know, just doing your your basic stuff. And then once you got out, uh, they sent me to carrier suitability, which was just an amazing operation. And this this unit would would had about twelve airplanes that you would take to the boat, and you take them and you'd fly them all. Uh, okay. So I was flying. The F-4, the F-8, the A-4, the A-6, the KA-6, the uh, A-3, and uh, and and we you just get out of one, get into the other one, and go do traps and 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 landings. I mean, it's just was absolutely amazing. Well, there's one more that uh, you didn't list that was up and coming, but before we talk about that one. Of all those aircraft you just listed, was there one that kind of you held your breath a little bit more or maybe one that was, uh, not to say you ever are complacent landing on the carrier, but one that was like, oh, that was pleasant? Well, that would be the A3. A3 was pleasant? <laughs> or you no, held... A3 was awful. Oh, you it, held your breath uh, on that yeah, one. Okay. Yeah. Every time I'd come through the 90, I'd, I'd, I'd have half flaps and then I'd, I'd, I'd roll out on, on final and I'd drop the flaps to full. And this airplane just start, wander around. start this barrel, you know, this crazy eight barrel roll as you're trying to come in and land on the carrier. <laughs> and this is really, you know, a, a big airplane to, to get into the landing area. So uh, that one was fun. The other ones were all perfect. Pretty, but pretty God, awesome. God bless the A3 yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the A4 was quite the opposite. The wingspan was so narrow, it didn't even have folding wings. So <laughs> lineup maybe wasn't as big a deal. Now, were you an LSO in the fleet? No, I wasn't. Okay. So you were in carrier suitability. Who were your LSOs? Was it We fleet? had, you had assigned some. LSOs okay. that were, that were so part buddies of, of our operation. Yeah. And they officers. would, they would work us as we we're getting ready for the boat. We'd have to take each one of these airplanes and make some field carrier landing practice That's just right. to get up to speed on, on them. Okay. But, yeah. uh, a lot of them are kind of test airplanes and so I always when I get started as I'm taking the runway you got to find the the uh, uh, airspeed indicator and, and you never know really where it, it's going to be so oh, there it is okay uh, this now, yeah oh on, on this. this test airplane because yeah. they've got something else 
a clock or yeah, some plastered equipment. all over the equipment, <laughs> over the, the uh, instrument all right. panel. Well, at some point now, this is what seventy three four time frame maybe seventy two uh, late seventy two. Okay, late seventy two. Okay. Yeah. Um, along comes this great big new aircraft from Grumman with swept swept wings, sweeping wings. Um, of course, the F-111 went to the carrier. I think that was a, just a couple folks who did that. Mm -hmm. But here comes the F-14 Tomcat. It's going to replace the F-4. And you're involved, as I understand it, in the carrier suitability of it. And I'm told that was fairly colorful because there was a lot to do. And everything the LSOs saw made it look like a, a particular bird and got its nickname that way, yeah? <laughs> the F-14 was wonderful. It just, you've, you've never... Maybe you have felt the power like that, but, but this, you know, we, we could almost accelerate going straight up. Wow. Um, the, uh, the whole concept of this swing wing airplane with the wings at 20 degrees, which it lets you loiter for two hours, and then when you get into operating, you, you, as you accelerate, the wings go back, and um, you can fly a, a very formidable fighter mission mm -hmm. that uh, I, I went against F-15s and beat them. I mean, we could. Oh, well, so you're not just landing these. You're uh, swarming yeah. around a bit, too? Yeah, we would we would uh, nice. go have a chance to, to fight everybody, and, yeah. and this was a very interesting airplane. Um, partic the, the airplane... The airplanes were test airplanes, and so uh, some of them, but they all originally didn't have weapon systems. So you you just flip a couple switches to bring the INSs on the, the rear. They had a rear cockpit, but wasn't hooked up to anything. I mean, it just you could talk to it. So people would come and ride with you, but they weren't. You know, they were just having fun. But then, as the, the during the next year. Uh, they would be bringing in weapon system parts. And so pretty soon you had a TAD that was in front of you that you didn't have before. And uh, the Rio in back is, is working on different things. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, you take off uh, southbound out of Pax River, and as you lift off, this airplane with the AUG-10 would just swing back and forth and plot 37 targets all the way down to Florida and then it would put <laughs> one through six and this is what I'm going to shoot my sparrows at uh, my uh, uh, Phoenix, Phoenix yeah. missiles yeah. at and you just you know it's fascinating as an F4 guy mm -hmm. you know we had a radar and it was pretty good but nothing like what this thing saw the and, nine. Yeah. yeah the yeah. Aug 9 was yeah. um so, so on this show before, Dozo, we've had people who have flown both the F-14 and, say, the F-18. Um, and we've compared those two multiple times. Do me a favor and compare the F-4 and the F-14. Now, again, they're different generation to a point and maybe even different mission to a point. But how would you compare the F-14 and the F-4? I love them both. But, <laughs> I mean, the F-4 was an interceptor started off as a bomber actually mm -hmm. and and uh, got presented to the navy and they they liked it but you know you, you it was a shake rattle and roll airplane if if when 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 you pulled on the g's the airplane would be buffeting Buffet, yeah. the whole time and okay. so um hmm. we we did what we needed to do to make it work the f14 was just sliced butter. It was. It just was so pleasant. Uh, the early airplanes, we had some problems with them. The the the, the throttles, you kind of had to set them and and don't mess with them uh, mm -hmm. while while you're coming around. And then when, once you get unloaded, then you can bring the power back up, kind of thing. It. Uh, but there were advantages too. That. The initial airplanes didn't have an aileron rudder interconnect, and so we could get into somebody where where we'd get slow. You get down to a 150 knots kind of thing, and if you slam the stick over to one side, the airplane would rotate the other way. It would depart Yikes. and start. The nose would just slide around, and then when you got it where you wanted, you 
pop the rudder the other way and, <laughs> and go right back at this guy. I mean, it was an awesome thing to be able to do, but you did, you had to do it. You couldn't do it too long because otherwise yeah. the airplane would go into a flat spin, yeah. which you didn't want to do. Yeah. So um, this was a, a very a very good thing. The, the airplane, I mean, you just had to love it. You loved the weapon system. It had four and four Sparrows and Sidewinders and then uh, six Phoenix. If you never carried that many, you'd carry two or three Total of them. Maybe. But, but uh, that was a wonderful, it was a wonderful weapon system. Yeah. And uh, you could, you'd be shooting at people that are 80 miles away. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And they built a gun back into it, which I've got a question coming up about that. But so you take it to the ship. I mean, any color trying to land aboard the ship with this thing? I, I understand it wasn't easy. I never flew it. Well, it, it, it felt to you, to the pilot, it felt great. Okay. Because you're sitting out here in the point of this, all, all this massive uh, airplane behind you. <laughs> it's all you. behind you, yeah. Yeah, it's all back there, and it's doing things. And we had the, the elevators on the on the F-14 are, are bigger than the wings on an F on a, an they, A-4. Yeah. They're huge <laughs> and they differential. So they're going like this. And then you've got uh, spoilers on top of the wings that are destroying the lift and they're popping up and down and popping up. And you're making little connect corrections with the glide. And so to you, your right center glide slope, everything's perfect. I'm coming right down. I'm going to put it right in the landing oh, area. I'm going to hook. Down, I'm going to yeah. get a three wire, and everything's great. And the LSO would come back and tell you, "What were you doing out there? <laughs> you had stuff coming all over the, you know, all, this this whole thing. Here's the pilot, and all this stuff's happening in the background. <laughs> and so that's why we called it the turkey because it just looked like it had." feathers going uh, up and down and, and everywhere and oh my. and so it was hard it was hard to get an ok3 in an f14 it just you were back there trouble is it landed 15 knots slower than the f4 so the f4 come whistling in and no, land no time for and a mistake, land no right? time to to make a mistake <laughs> and the f14 is just back there going <laughs> <laughs> here i come here i come my goodness so okay very very safe but uh, yeah. it's hard to win the greenie board with the <laughs> Well, I, I always used to say, because I wasn't particularly great flying the ball anyway, was, hey, I got a board and they can use the airplane again. <laughs> so there you go. So you do a handful of the testing it needs to go to the fleet, and then you go to the fleet with it, right? I go to the fleet as the second and third crews with BF-2. So wow. the, uh, BF-1 and BF-2 were resurrected uh, for uh, the F-14. Um, we went out, we were going back out to Vietnam. Actually, uh, during the, the first cruise, they actually went to Vietnam and flew some combat sorties uh, with the F-14. Is that right? Yeah. Like maybe at the very, very end? Yeah, the, at, okay. at the very end, wow. before, just before. So we were coming back just after that, and uh, there was a lot of interest in the F-14. Uh, we, you talk about Alert 5 launches, you got a lot of them because we'd get up in the North China Sea mm -hmm. and uh, near Vladivostok and they'd come out with bisons and the bears Soviet. and uh, mm -hmm. maize. And so you're on the alert five, bang, next thing you know, you're, you're gonna go find these guys. Uh, the interesting thing, these are, these are huge bombers, uh, have four contra, contra rotating props, mm -hmm. uh, silver, red stars uh, we would join on them and we had our own <laughs> little set of rules that that we could use you weren't allowed to hit anybody but you could do just about anything else and so uh, we'd come in with a section of of two f-14s we did this with the f-4s too okay uh, and you'd put one of them a mile back uh, you know, these guys are usually flying a kind of a loose-deuce uh, spread formation. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the lead would go in and, and mess around with the, with the lead bear. So you couldn't really get to the cockpit, but we could join on the tail gunner 
and his flight controls back there and we just fly right with the tail gunner and the the rios would usually have a centerfold from playboy to to, to show <laughs> international relations show Keep yeah this is uh, oh dear. <laughs> and and we would just do things uh, the f14 was pretty uh pretty nimble and so you'd you'd come in and and flip it on its back and just kind of join <laughs> join up on the on the tail and then we'd stick the tail the uh, tail hook up <laughs> and flip it over and then we'd show them the wings back and the wings forward and just we're just doing stuff yeah. uh, and they would just all the little windows on the beef on the uh, bear mm -hmm. would be full of people with cameras and and <laughs> taken up and uh, I think one of the things I think we used to do it with the F four more, but uh, the uh, Rio would the Rio would take his helmet off and turn it around and put his oxygen mask on the back, and then lean lean back against his instrument panel, and it would look like a rear facing Rio, <laughs> and the front face. So I I keep every time I see one of these. Uh, MIG killer books or something. I, uh -huh. I keep looking for the picture of the F4 Mike or whatever that that has a the rear facing the rear, the rear facing, facing Rio. Rio. <laughs> I thought you were going to say then you would turn your head in such a way that it made it look like the Rio was an exorcist guy with his neck turning oh. the, the wrong direction or something. <laughs> but um, that's crazy. So right, just uh, I think hopefully most people watching or listening are aware of the Cold War. The Soviets would come out want to take a look at the carrier, and they're maybe even listening or snooping on the Trons. But we didn't want to let them do that without, hey, we're here too. So they'd send out their bombers and different things, and we'd join up on them. And and uh, amongst Airedales, though, eh, it was good spirits, right? You weren't? Uh... Well, it was more, it, there was more to it than that. Okay. Um, they were trying to find the carriers normally. Oh, okay. And somehow finding a carrier in the, in the North China Sea is just, not that easy um, and we would know that the bears are up there we would be doing you know we never omitted anything you didn't uh, have the, the radar or the tack in on uh, right. and we would take off from the carrier we'd go 25 miles to a, a, a vertical point where we would then climb and appear and then we would come after the as if the, the ship bears, is maybe over as there as if the ship is over there so then the, you'd see the bears heading heading over and looking in that area but they just wouldn't find huh. wouldn't find the carrier quite Cat and often mouse games all right that's yeah. crazy we did have a rule that anytime they did find the carrier that we wanted to have f4s f14s on it so uh, you'd always be kind of tucked in as you as you flew by. Right. So in other words, if they're going to take a picture of the carrier, they're going to have a, a Tomcat in the foreground or yes. a Phantom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that they can't just send it to Washington or the news and say, "Oh, look, we found. Oh, we're right there, <laughs> ready to go." We watched it yeah. the whole time. But it sounds like I mean, obviously you had some uh, male uh, uh, humor amongst uh, folks, but it was was it fairly cordial, or I mean, yeah, there's only seemed, so much yelling you can to do. Be. To, between cockpits, but that's good. Wow. How long did you end up uh, serving? Because I know you did the F-14 tours, but that's where I my studies couldn't find much more. Did you end up serving a, a full career? I did. I just did it in the reserves. I finished okay. up. Uh, unfortunately, when I retired uh, at about seven, 16 years active, mm -hmm. they made me a commander. Okay. You, I'm fortunate because you didn't want to. I, yeah, because I up. wanted to go fly for <laughs> for 301, 302, uh, and which was the uh, F-14s okay. at um, the reserve squadrons and F-14s. Okay, but if you're a commander, ah. then you can only be the skipper, and that doesn't work that way in the reserves. Right. So, um, so you left active duty, but you stayed reserve to I get the time reserves, you needed. Yeah, when something non-flying, maybe. Yeah. Okay. What'd you do on the outside? I went and flew for Flying Tiger Line, oh, yeah. and I was flying uh, DC-8s and 747s for Flying Tiger Lines, and then in 1989, uh, FedEx bought Flying Tiger right. Lines, and so then I was, I flew the 747 for them, and then the DC-10, and then the MD-11 when it yeah. came out. So, 
I'm putting myself on the spot. We've had another gentleman in that seat who did something similar. Uh, maybe Bob Strang. Does that name sound familiar? He was. It our, does. It sounds familiar, yeah. Uh, he was our C-7 caribou guest. He had flown some Vietnam missions uh, in that platform. And I think he went to Flying Tigers as well. I've done too many of these. I can't keep track of it all. All right, so when it comes to fighters, how many hours across how many, if you know, number of airplanes? I mean, it seems, sounds to me I'm like 30 or 40, it seems like. Yeah, that kind of numbers. Uh, I haven't actually added that up. No? I, I had about 7,000 hours. Um, and Not counting the Flying Tigers? Or? Yeah, no, that just Navy, yeah. Wow, that's a lot of time. How about traps? Uh, uh, yeah, just... I'm not the Centurion. I think I, uh, 800 or something 800, like okay. that, yeah. But but in a lot of different aircraft. I mean, yes. some people, like I only ever took, well, I took the Hornet and the Super Hornet, but they're pretty similar. But you took so many different aircraft to the boat. That's just amazing. Wow, okay. And do you did you do any more flying apart from the big heavies uh, on your own for fun? Any no. general aviation stuff? No. Yeah. Well, we'll have to introduce you to Bones, who owns this hangar. He's got his fleet of F5s. So. Okay. But you could uh, jump right in and pick up where you left. I'm, where I'm ready to, right? to go now. Yeah. Oh, dear. All right. Well, I've got a couple of listener questions I want to ask. But before I do, I'm glad I have my little notes here because I reminded myself of in 2016. Let's talk about that because you were part of a reconciliation tour. And we don't have to necessarily, unless you want to, get into how that came about. But you were one of them. And on my F4 episode, gosh, I don't remember what episode that was, but it was with uh, Jack Ench and Tiger Kerr, uh, Fingers and Tiger, uh, they talked about being part of it as well. And I think Willie D did as well, yes. he was part of it. Um, but summarize what that reconciliation um, purpose was and, and your role in it, because you got to go back to Vietnam. Yeah, I got a call from uh, Charlie, uh, was a, a Marine F-4 pilot. Okay. And. Was that his first name? No, that's, right? his, that's his first name, yeah. Because okay, Charlie was also kind of a slang term for the folks <coughs> that we're about to reconcile with. Yeah, I'm trying to remember his last name. That's I okay. can't, uh, it's not coming to me. Um, so he was in contact with a uh, Vietnamese general who was an airline pilot. Okay. And uh, they were putting together a trip to, to visit Haiphong. Uh Hanoi, I'm sorry. And uh, I thought that sounded like a great idea, and I could just use my airline miles uh, to, to buy tickets to Hanoi. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we went. And the idea was that we would meet the airplanes that we were, the, the, the MiG pilots <laughs> that were fighting against us. Um, I knew that the, the pilot that I shot down died and the, and that the flight lead on that flight uh, had died two months later mm. as one of uh, Steve Ritchie's kills. Oh. And so I just didn't expect to find much in the, you know, the, of on your engagement, on my particular engagement, but mm -hmm. there turned out to be some, it was kind of interesting. Uh, so we, we reported to the Hanoi, uh, and had a nice hotel and um, went down and and met, I think there were 25 MiG pilots there plus translators and uh, the more we worked with them, the more we talked with them, the more we reminisced with them, you realized that they were just in exactly the same position that we were. They're, you're just trying to keep from getting shot down right. you're trying to to get the job done uh, and it was really interesting to learn uh, they they would take uh, high school uh, high schoolers and send them to uh, Moscow and they would finish their high school and they would learn basic training and then they'd transition them into the MiG-17 or MiG-21 uh, and send them back to Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And they would be part of the squadron and 
then they have to deal with me as they're trying to take off. And every every flight of theirs was uh, a full combat flight with, you know, terrible consequences if you screw it up. Yeah. So this is, this was interesting. Um, and we learned things like that the uh, MiG-17, when they ejected out of the MiG-17, it was a pretty rough ride and they generally ended up not flying for four or five months afterwards getting body parts back into the into the right place kind of thing mm-hmm. um, I was I was one of five I think MiG killers in the group and so we had they had a special Vietnamese TV show where uh, they just asked us questions and translated and uh, told us so we, we did one of those shows and then uh, the second show, the uh, communications director for the uh, for Vietnamese TV said that um, the sister of of the guy I shot down was uh, wanted to meet me on the TV show. Wow! So she heard your story and said, "Wait, that's my brother." Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I didn't, that didn't sound attractive to me. Um, I, I, I couldn't imagine how that would work out well. Uh, but they convinced me that, uh, the Vietnamese are very forgiving and, and that, uh, and that this is worth doing. So we had another show and we went about a half an hour and then, and then this MC comes, comes up with this lady and she's got a, a picture of the guy that I killed and they look just the same <laughs> it, it, very very impressive uh, and then they had two or three uh, three MiG-17 pilots that that were his buddies uh, also so they talked me into they, they invited me to their house in uh, South Hanoi and so that uh, Charlie went with me, and, and we went down, and we stopped in a in a kind of a, a open area, and and got out of the buses, out out of the cars, and met some of these family members, and it was just a bunch of head nodding and thanking, and um, and then we went to their house and had a five course meal kind of thing with lots of vodka the uh anybody that learns to fly in china in uh, russia uh, drinks a lot of vodka okay and so there was some vodka and and after uh, oh and then we went uh, i'm sorry we first went to the grave site where he's buried okay. and we had some flowers and presented the flowers and um that was nice. This was a, a military uh, cemetery. And so then back to the house and, and a lovely meal, very mm-hmm. nice. And then the, uh, the the communist rep that was in charge of this area that was allowing us to go and visit, uh, we had met him first, had to stop and get permission to go to this town. And he stood up and said, uh, this has been a great honor for you to visit us, and we are renaming the road uh, to be Doze Nai Way uh, in honor of, of your visit. And um, and so then the, the head of the family, who was an uncle, uh, stood up and said, you know, we were, we were very pleased when 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 was assigned to VT20 uh, to VF I'm sorry to MiG 21s mm-hmm. this is the top top uh, position and on May 10th we lost him uh, but now 30 years later we've got a new pilot we have an an F4 
F-14 pilot, and we hope that he will come and stay with us in our house and, and uh, stay in communications. And so I still do uh, talk, I, I send emails back and forth uh, wow. uh, every every two or three months. Yeah. Uh, we just exchange some. So that's, that's nice. Um, we had a chance to go back out to Kep Airfield uh, and we couldn't get on the base. They had different MiG-23s or something that they're flying now, but um, the uh, I mentioned uh, when we were coming on the air, into the airfield, all the MiG-21s, I'm sorry, MiG-17s sitting mm -hmm. in revetments yep. alongside the runway. Well, uh, Colonel Dow is one of these MiG-17 pilots, and he was sitting there on May 20 on on May 10th, and he says, "I'm just sitting there watching, and I watch two MiG-21s, and they're rolling. They're just just about to take off, and then all hell broke loose because we were coming in supersonic, so you couldn't hear us coming. This was this we were." you know, faster than the speed of sound, faster than sound. Mm. And so suddenly there's just a kaboom. Can you imagine two F-4s 50 feet over the top of you? And he said at that point, you know, tanks are coming off, missile fires, airplanes, you know, missiles in the air. And, uh, and, he, and he says it's just the end of the world. <laughs> well, and he was one that survived. But yeah, so he was fine. Wow. What a story, Dezo, because it speaks, I think, to the heart of humans. I mean, we can we can be at odds, we can war, we can do our duties, as you stated, each side was doing their duties. And in the end, it sounds like you had closure, and this family had closure. They lost their fighter pilot, and they gained you, and yeah. uh, you keep in touch now, and that's, uh, that's heartwarming, you know, and it's so good, I think, of Charlie to figure out a way to make this happen for the people that were involved. And then I guess, did they maybe come to America later, or was that? They did, they came a year later. Okay. They came to San Diego. Yeah. And we had agreed to kind of host them and, and set it up. Mm -hmm. So we picked the Miramar Air Show weekend. Oh. And uh, took them aboard the Midway and uh, had, and, and took them out to, to meet the Miramar Air Show, which is just yeah. a fantastic uh, flying exhibit. And the Blue Angels came, of course, and, sure. and CL-22s and everything else. And mm -hmm. um, we were staying with them, you know, had had one of these uh, party rooms up in, the, up in the front kind of thing. And as the Blue Angels flew by the first time, you could see the MiG, the MiG pilots are going, so close. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so... MIGs are flying 18 inch sp spread on, uh, on the their blues. wingtips. Yeah. yeah, the blues, yeah. So it's pretty, uh, yeah. pretty amazing. Wow, that is that is a happy ending to an otherwise very ugly situation. I think for all involved nations and individually. So good. Okay, I want to transition to some listener questions I have for you. Now these are provided by folks that support the Fighter Pilot Podcast on Patreon. And I tell them, hey, I'm going to sit down with Kurt Dose, and I send them a link or your uh, little one-page bio there that I found. And they say, oh, I want to know this. So if you don't mind, I'll put these to you and who asked them. Now, you already answered this one. Uh, it's from Gordon Bradbury down in Australia. Did you miss not having a gun on your F-4 over Vietnam? At some point, the missiles will be good enough that you don't need the gun. Mm -hmm. uh, the gun the gun is, is a final delivery weapon system. It it uh, the, the shooting envelope ends up being very close to what yeah. you're what you're going for. If I look at my situation, I should have had four MIGs. I should <laughs> I should have had at least the you know we did we only had sparrows uh, so our After you our radar weapons your, wasn't yeah. wasn't that good. But mm -hmm. it was the sparrow was a great weapon up and away, and if we had been taking on these MiGs head on, if I didn't have to VID them, we could have, uh, it would have worked fine. But yeah. so the Sidewinder, 
was a good missile. And if you look at the new AIM-9X, uh, it's just breathtaking. It oh, yeah. breaks my heart because <laughs> they, when they were testing the AIM-9X, instead of a warhead, they, they would put a little video camera transmitter in the, in the weapon system and they were shooting F-4s yeah. <laughs> and all of these shots of these F-4s doing one gallant final maneuver in this <laughs> sparrow, <laughs> the QF, sidewinder. Would, unmanned QF-4, I at know. least, but yes, yeah. it's yeah. And, and, and it sure. just get hammered. Yeah. And so if, if, my, if my sidewinders had worked, I wouldn't have needed a gun. Uh, as it was, I would have loved to have had one. I yeah. was I, my my windscreen was full of MIG. There, I I could have stitched picked, your name. Yeah, I yeah. could have written a name across the yeah. wing. Yeah, it's just. But did you fly a model later with the gun? Because Tiger, who was on my F four episode, he said that he didn't prefer it as much. Just later, you know, after combat, because of, I guess it was pretty far forward and it made the performance a little less. Well, they ma they mounted it on the F four E, and it has a kind of a canoe <clears throat> down under the. It, it shrunk their weapon system down there. Hmm. They, their radar got smaller, and they they put it underneath. Uh, as far as I know, it it worked uh, okay. on you know, but it. I had it in the F fourteen. Mm -hmm. And I and I loved it on the F fourteen, but I had the same missiles except as the, the, the AIM fifty four. I, th I think that you just got to make the missiles better. I th and I think that they're think getting they that point now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, you, when you can shoot it off your wing and it goes and picks <laughs> off somebody at 5 o'clock, that's, that's crazy. pretty Im yeah. impressive. Yeah, for sure. Well, they, uh, they have improved the weapons, but it's still the same old battle. The F-4 was designed originally without a gun. Now we've got the F-35 B and C that can have the pod, but anyway, let's not uh, get into that. Jim Gundog says, what were the expected or unexpected benefits from your SIRGRAD assignment in addition to instructing in a new airframe in the training command? So did you go into it thinking this is what I'll get and you got it, or did you go into it thinking this is what I'll get and I didn't, or you didn't think about it and you got something, you know, anyway, I'm gonna get myself tied up here, but. Oh, I got, I got told on numerous occasions that it is the best thing that can happen to you. And undoubtedly it did. I mean, I, it made me just a great pilot. Because you were instructing. Because that. I was instructing okay. and teaching people how to do formation flights, how to do ACM, how to do gunnery. Um, and so these are the skills that I took back to BF-121 and BF-92 uh, and they were good skills, kept me alive. Yeah. Uh, so you weren't just wet behind the ears when you got to the fleet, you had a little more yeah, experience. Yeah, I had quite a lot. I, yeah. I think I had 2,000 hours. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, it was a pretty, I mean, as a bachelor, the, the uh, <laughs> training command was, was wonderful because we would fly two or three flights a day, and then on the weekend, people needed cross-country time. So you could fly them to San Diego, fly them to uh, Washington, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, this was, so this was good for them, but I was racking up 120 hours a month. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I actually got a letter from somebody that said knock that off you can't <laughs> you can't fly that much uh, i think that's how many hours i got in my last two years in the navy <laughs> uh does so i'm a little jealous about that all right next question is from michael tennish how difficult was it to join an existing squadron immediately after transitioning to the phantom and fly combat missions right away we pretty much talked about it but you again were trained six weeks sounds like at bf-121 so you weren't brand new but come on, sometimes it takes a little experience to really know, hey, this switch is over here and this is what it feels like when I turn like that. The interesting thing that I find out later is that the initial F-4 squadrons all came from F-3 demons. And that these F-3... Which was also McDonnell, I believe. It, yeah, mm -hmm. the F-3 demon was just a big interceptor, you know, no dogfighting, just get yourself 30 degrees to the, to the other airplane. And so um, they were apparently looking forward to my arrival and the Rios were, were bidding on who's gonna fly in my back seat kind of thing. <laughs> and so 
uh, I look back at my best man, Bill Townsend, came from the demon. And, and mm. so we were showing up together, and uh, that that's kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I, never, I never had any trouble nobody ever said no i mean we could you could do whatever you could get away with and and not hurt yourself <laughs> um, back up the airplane hopefully no you did yeah and you didn't want to hurt the airplane yeah. uh but they they were uh i'm i'm as a matter of fact i've got a reunion coming up at tailhook in two weeks uh with vf92 and oh. and we'll have about 20 of the guys uh, and we've got a uh, part of our celebration is a memorial service where we're going to honor the say goodbye to the guys that, that we lost and yeah. there's a lot of them <laughs> oh, well, yes well uh, I will be there as well now as people watch and listen to this it's probably in the past but I'm looking forward to making the annual trek up to Reno for Tailhook. So I'll look for you. That's great. And uh, thanks very much. All right, so now I have two questions related to Top Gun, one sort of before and one after. Uh, the first is from Mike Hindle. How did your first deployment help with Top Gun? Did you think to yourself, hey, I saw what they were talking about? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's exactly what Top Gun's talking about. Right. And they, they would always try and connect the bit of information that they're that they're teaching the the advantage of combat spread the advantage of uh, you know singling out a, a particular airplane and you get him dodging one airplane and then the other one shoots him down um, we we could see that and, and we would work it uh, we went up and we fought against the 102s uh, the 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 uh, Delta Wings, and um, if you responded to their big first move and got rid of your airspeed or, you know, slowed down, then you were toast. If you just did one more loop and came back around, he was, he didn't have any energy left and, mm -hmm. and you could take care of him kind of thing. Same thing we needed to do with MiG-17s. And so, uh, Top Gun curriculum was born out of fire. You know, they they needed to fix this. They were losing too many airplanes, and um, they, I think, really did an excellent job yeah. of putting that that whole course together. Indeed, which is a great segue into my question from Jevin. How did your training at Top Gun change <laughs> your second deployment, and did it make a difference that day, May 10th, over Cap? Well. Absolutely. I mean, everything that I knew, I knew from Top Gun. I had adjusted all my previous thoughts on on how you dogfight an airplane, uh, so it was it was crucial. Yeah. All right. Last question is from Nick Forrester. To what extent did you get assistance from EC-121 airborne early warning aircraft or Red Crown in detecting MiGs? Now you had said the word red, words Red Crown earlier, and I let it go because I knew we had this coming. Um, and then just as a caveat, given the small visual signature of both MiG-17 and MiG-21, uh, depending on visual pickups, must have led to short-range engagements with little opportunity to position for the advantage of the BVR AIM-7. So we've already talked a lot about this, and let me see if I can tee this up a little bit more. Um, you couldn't really use the AIM-7 too much in Vietnam because you had to put eyes on everything, and by the time you did that, your, set, your AIM-7 Sparrow was essentially relegated to Inside okay, can't use it range, anymore. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the beginning of his question and help us understand what Red Crown is, how valuable was that? And you've already said they told you that day, hey, there's something out there. Yes. What, but what does Red Crown start with that? Red Crown is a cruiser that sits off in North Vietnam. I think it was the Oklahoma. Hmm. Uh, and so this is their we call there. sign, right? Yeah, this is just their call sign. And so they would come up and, and tell us when MiGs are in the air. And so that was always, that was nice to know. Um, they didn't get into personal control. Uh, somebody else would do that. Our E-2s would mm -hmm. would, would uh, put us on the target and, and help us start off the fight in an offensive position if you, yeah. if you could. Yeah. Um, the, uh, 
the 121s, uh, I don't think we, I don't think we talked to them. They never, they never called me. Uh, but they, those, that's where the speakers are. I think they, the Russian speakers and the Vietnamese speakers would be listening in on. So we're uh, eavesdropping on their Yeah, radios. we're eavesdropping, mm-hmm. and then yeah. that message traffic goes out top secret or something, yeah. too. Uh, well, speaking of that, one advantage I have as the host is I can ask them questions that I don't know, but I can pretend it's for the audience. Um, how does the destroyer know that there are uh, MiGs airborne? Is it because they've got radar, or are they also listening, or are they being fed that information from somewhere else? But aren't they, right? They're off the coast a little ways. Yeah, they do, and they got attacked uh, a couple oh, yeah. of times, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so uh, they would be listening in on, on, the, on the overall frequency that, hey, you've got uh, targets coming in. And that's, of course, what bar cap was for. We would, we would position ourselves between the, the uh, North Vietnam and the ship mm-hmm. to be able to handle anything coming out towards the ship. They never, they never did try and attack a carrier, but they would go after these uh, destroyers that mm-hmm. are pounding away with their five-inch guns. Uh, and providing intel to the pilots. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, all right. Well, gosh, I mean, this has been amazing. Uh, you mentioned this book earlier. I actually bought this book uh, when I was at Top Gun as the uh, MIG killer coordinator. Now they call it the combat speaker. But uh, I've got a bunch of signatures in there, and I'd like to, if you don't mind, add yours to it because I've met a lot of folks like you over the years, and a lot of your stories are in there. And uh, I don't know what I'll do with this book someday, but hopefully maybe a museum will take it. I'm sure they will. But <laughs> I'd like to add you to that if I may. And and uh, what have I not asked you about that uh, maybe I should? I, for example, I'm curious what your reunion was with your father. We talked about him getting the phone call in the middle of the night. Did he meet the uh, squadron when you flew yes, off the ship? Yes, of course. What of was course. that like? It was excellent and uh, kind of typical. We, we came in with... 12 airplanes uh, into Miramar, and the skipper uh, assigned Hawkins and I uh, to be the uh, solos uh, coming in on the air show. So the the uh, the whole had some sort of formation with okay. with uh, 10 airplanes, uh, which looked good. Sure, and we started off behind them. And came in at 50 feet, uh, doing about 0.98 yeah. kind of thing. And as as we came in underneath, right as we as they crossed into the Miramar, uh-huh. we pulled up and went through the formation oh with two and started spitting out flares. And the flares <laughs> came down and actually set the grass on fire uh, out on the other side of the runway. So that. That wasn't so great, oh, but uh, it was a spectacular yeah. show, and and uh, that worked well. Wow, was your dad just because we could? Yeah, well, he wasn't. Was he still on active duty when you? No. Okay. No, when you, he had uh, retired I, about three years before, before that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, what keeps you busy these days, Dezo? I have twelve grandkids, wow. and that is a wonderful. Th- there's there's nothing better. Okay. And, uh, How many here in San Diego? Uh, I've got 10 of them up in Los Angeles wow. in Altadena and two of them in Ames, Iowa. And that's where I was yesterday when you were trying to contact me. I was flying back Sorry from, about that. from Ames, <laughs> Iowa. Yeah. Uh, All right. And the last question we always ask on the Fighter Pilot Podcast is about call signs because people find call signs funny and fun. And uh, so, Kurt Dose? Dozo? I mean, Dozo. Yeah. It's. Uh, I had a perfectly good call sign that I was using Scarlet, which was my father's call sign. Oh. Uh, and so I, I had done all of my flight training and, you know, the advanced training command and everything. And I was, we were always Scarlet flight and, and that was fine. So, and when I got to 121 transition to the F4, nothing happened. I was still Scarlet. And then as I got, as I got to the ship, uh, I was still Scarlet for a while, but they, uh, w- we went to Yakuska, and they were going to the hot sea baths in in Yakuska. And this is, they have uh, 
kind of tubs, sort of n narrow tubs that you sit in in hot hot water, and uh, a little girl comes in and and washes you off with a you know all around neck and everything, and mm -hmm. then when she, when she gets down to your private parts, she gives you the sponge and and says hi dozo, which I didn't know what that meant, but I. It sort of meant wash it yourself, I, th I think. But, but uh, this is when we when we came. I think it means please. But uh, when we came out of the hot sea bath, the skipper looks around and says, "Okay, your call signs Dozo," and that was it. Uh, you, there's no there vote about it. You don't uh, you don't change anything. And it was Dozo or High Dozo. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dozo. <laughs> Thank you. You've been a wonderful guest, and uh, I'm just so amazed by your stories and your humility. Thank you. Um, and also just the fact that, you know, there's no other, as I understand, duo in the world that uh, where the father and son have both been victorious in air-to-air -air combat. So uh, congratulations on that. But I think more than anything, I just think I really loved the story about the reconciliation, and, and I'm sure that brought a lot of peace for you and definitely for their family. So thank you for sharing that as well and for your time today and, uh, and your service. Thank you, Jella. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I sure do every time. Now, in case we had some jargon there you didn't understand, go on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary as well as musings, which are just our blogs and some cool merchandise that you can check out as well. So we'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long.